Guglielmo Marconi was an Italian inventor and electrical engineer known for his pioneering work on long-distance radio transmission and for his development of Marconi's law in a radio telegraph system. He is often credited as the inventor of radio, and he shared the 1909 Nobel Prize in Physics with Carl Ferdinand Braun in recognition of their contributions to the development of wireless telegraphy. Marconi was an entrepreneur, businessman, and founder of the Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company in the United Kingdom in 1897, which became the Marconi Company. He succeeded in making a commercial success of radio by innovating and building on the work of previous experimenters and physicists. In 1929, the King of Italy ennobled Marconi as a Marchese. Biography Early Years Marconi was born into the Italian nobility as Guglielmo Giovanni Maria Marconi in Bologna on April 25, 1874, the second son of Giuseppe Marconi, an Italian aristocratic landowner from Peretta Term, and his Irish Scots wife Annie Jameson, daughter of Andrew Jameson of Daphne Castle in County Wexford, Ireland, and granddaughter of John Jameson, founder of whiskey distillers Jameson and Sons. Between the ages of two and six, Marconi and his elder brother Alfonso were brought up by his mother in the English town of Bedford. After returning to Italy, and at the age of 18 University of Bologna physicist Augusto Righi, neighbor of Marconi who had done research on Heinrich Hertz's work, permitted Marconi to attend lectures at the university and use the lab and library as well. Marconi received further education in Florence at the Istituto Cavallero and, later, in Livorno. Marconi did not do well in school, according to Robert McHenry though historian Giuliano Carotti characterizes him in his biography as a true genius. He was baptized as a Catholic but had been brought up as a member of the Anglican Church, being married into it, although this marriage was later annulled. Marconi was confirmed in the Catholic faith and became a devout member of the Church before his marriage to Maria Cristina in 1927. Radio Work during his early years, Marconi had an interest in science and electricity and in the early 1890s he began working on the idea of wireless telegraphy i.e., the transmission of telegraph messages without connecting wires as used by the electric telegraph. This was not a new idea, numerous investigators and inventors had been exploring wireless telegraph technologies and even building systems using electric conduction, electromagnetic induction, and optical, light signaling for over 50 years, but none had proven technically and commercially successful. A relatively new development came from Heinrich Hertz, who demonstrated beginning in 1888 that one could produce and detect electromagnetic radiation now generally known as radio waves, at the time more commonly called Hertzian waves or etheric waves. There was a great deal of interest in radio waves in the physics community, but the interest was in radio as a scientific phenomenon, not in its potential as a communication method. Physicists generally looked on radio waves as an invisible form of light, a short-range phenomenon which could only travel along a line of sight path, and thus its range was limited to the visual horizon-like existing forms of visual signaling, making it unsuitable for long-distance communication. Hertz's death in 1894 brought published reviews of his earlier discoveries including a demonstration on the transmission and detection of radio waves by the British physicist Oliver Lodge and an article about Hertz's work by Marconi's teacher, Augusto Righi. Righi's article renewed Marconi's interest in developing a wireless telegraphy system based on radio waves, a line of inquiry that he noted other inventors did not seem to be pursuing. Transmission Breakthrough a breakthrough came that summer when Marconi found that much greater range could be achieved after he raised the height of his antenna and, borrowing from a technique used in wired telegraphy, grounding his transmitter and receiver. With these improvements the system was capable of transmitting signals up to and over hills. The monopole antenna reduced the frequency of the waves compared to the dipole antennas used by Hertz, and radiated vertically polarized radio waves which could travel longer distances. By this point, he concluded that a device could become capable of spanning greater distances, with additional funding and research, and would prove valuable both commercially and militarily. Marconi's experimental apparatus proved to be the first engineering complete, commercially successful radio transmission system. 
Marconi wrote to the Ministry of Post and Telegraphs, then under the direction of the Honorable Pietro La Cava, explaining his wireless telegraph machine and asking for funding. He never received a response to his letter which was eventually dismissed by the minister who wrote to the Longara on the document, referring to the insane asylum on Via della Lungara in Rome. In 1896, Marconi spoke with his family friend Carlo Gardini, honorary consul at the United States Consulate in Bologna, about leaving Italy to go to England. Gardini wrote a letter of introduction to the ambassador of Italy in London, Annabelle Ferrero, explaining who Marconi was and about these extraordinary discoveries. In his response, Ambassador Ferrero advised them not to reveal the results until after they had obtained the copyrights. He also encouraged him to come to England where he believed it would be easier to find the necessary funds to convert the findings from Marconi's experiment into a practical use. Finding little interest or appreciation for his work in Italy, Marconi travelled to London in early 1896 at the age of 21, accompanied by his mother, to seek support for his work. He spoke fluent English in addition to Italian. Marconi arrived at Dover and the customs officer opened his case to find various contraptions and apparatus. The customs officer immediately contacted the Admiralty in London. While there, Marconi gained the interest and support of William Preece, the chief electrical engineer of the British Post Office. The British become interested. Marconi made his first demonstration of his system for the British government in July 1896. A further series of demonstrations for the British followed by March 1897, Marconi had transmitted Morse code signals over a distance of about across Salisbury Plain. On May 13, 1897, Marconi sent the world's first ever wireless communication over open sea. The experiment, based in Wales, witnessed a message transversed over the Bristol Channel from Flatholm Island to Lavernock Point in Penarth, a distance of the message read Are you ready? The transmitting equipment was almost immediately relocated to Bray and Down Fort on the Somerset coast, stretching the range to. Impressed by these and other demonstrations, Preece introduced Marconi's ongoing work to the general public at two important London lectures, Telegraphy Without Wires, at the Toynbee Hall on December 11, 1896, and Signaling Through Space Without Wires given to the Royal Institution on June 4, 1897. Numerous additional demonstrations followed, and Marconi began to receive international attention. In July 1897, he carried out a series of tests at La Spezia, in his home country, for the Italian government. A test for Lloyds between Balikasal and Rathlin Island, Northern Ireland, was conducted on July 6, 1898. The English Channel was crossed on March 27, 1899, from Wymarus, France to South Foreland Lighthouse, England, and in the autumn of 1899, the first demonstrations in the United States took place, with the reporting of the America's Cup international yacht races at New York. Marconi sailed to the United States at the invitation of the New York Herald newspaper to cover the America's Cup races off Sandy Hook, New Jersey. The transmission was done aboard the SS Ponce, a passenger ship of the Porto Rico line. Marconi left for England on November 8, 1899 on the American lines, and he and his assistants installed wireless equipment aboard during the voyage. On November 15 St. Paul became the first ocean liner to report her imminent return to Great Britain by wireless when Marconi's Royal Needles Hotel radio station contacted her 66 nautical miles off the English coast. Transatlantic Transmissions At the turn of the 20th century, Marconi began investigating the means to signal completely across the Atlantic in order to compete with the transatlantic telegraph cables. Marconi established a wireless transmitting station at Marconi House, Rosslar Strand, Co-Wexford in 1901 to act as a link between Poldhu in Cornwall, England, and Clifton in Co-Galway, Ireland. He soon made the announcement that the message was received at Signal Hill in St. John's, Newfoundland, now part of Canada, on December 12, 1901, using a kite-supported antenna for reception signals transmitted by the company's new high-power station at Poldhu, Cornwall. The distance between the two points was about 
It was heralded as a great scientific advance, yet there also was and continues to be considerable skepticism about this claim. The exact wavelength used is not known, but it is fairly reliably determined to have been in the neighborhood of 350 meters, frequency 850 kilohertz. The tests took place at a time of day during which the entire transatlantic path was in daylight. We now know, although Marconi did not know then, that this was the worst possible choice. At this medium wavelength, long-distance transmission in the daytime is not possible because of heavy absorption of the skywave in the ionosphere. It was not a blind test, Marconi knew in advance to listen for a repetitive signal of three clicks, signifying the Morse code letter S. The clicks were reported to have been heard faintly and sporadically. There was no independent confirmation of the reported reception, and the transmissions were difficult to distinguish from atmospheric noise. A detailed technical review of Marconi's early transatlantic work appears in John S. Belrose's work of 1995. The Polda transmitter was a two-stage circuit. Feeling challenged by skeptics, Marconi prepared a better organized and documented test. In February 1902, the SS Philadelphia sailed west from Great Britain with Marconi aboard, carefully recording signals sent daily from the Polda station. The test results produced coherer tape reception up to, and audio reception up to. The maximum distances were achieved at night, and these tests were the first to show that radio signals for medium wave and long wave transmissions travel much farther at night than in the day. During the daytime, signals had only been received up to about, less than half of the distance claimed earlier at Newfoundland, where the transmissions had also taken place during the day. Because of this, Marconi had not fully confirmed the Newfoundland claims, although he did prove that radio signals could be sent for hundreds of kilometers, despite some scientists' belief that they were essentially limited to line-of-sight distances. On December 17, 1902, a transmission from the Marconi station in Glossé Bay, Nova Scotia, Canada became the world's first radio message to cross the Atlantic from North America. In 1901, Marconi built a station near South Wellfleet, Massachusetts that sent a message of greetings on January 18, 1903 from United States President Theodore Roosevelt to King Edward VII of the United Kingdom. However, consistent transatlantic signaling was difficult to establish. Marconi began to build high-powered stations on both sides of the Atlantic to communicate with ships at sea, in competition with other inventors. In 1904, a commercial service was established to transmit nightly news summaries to subscribing ships, which could incorporate them into their onboard newspapers. A regular transatlantic radio telegraph service was finally begun on October 17, 1907 between Clifton, Ireland and Glossay Bay, but even after this the company struggled for many years to provide reliable communication to others. Titanic the role played by Marconi Co. Wireless in maritime rescues raised public awareness of the value of radio and brought fame to Marconi, particularly the sinkings of the RMS Titanic on April 15, 1912 and the RMS Lusitania on May 7, 1915. RMS Titanic radio operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride were not employed by the White Star Line but by the Marconi International Marine Communication Company. After the sinking of the ocean liner on April 15, 1912, survivors were rescued by the RMS Carpathia of the Cunard Line. Also employed by the Marconi Company was David Sarnoff, who later headed RCA. Wireless communications were reportedly maintained for 72 hours between Carpathia and Sarnoff, but Sarnoff's involvement has been questioned by some modern historians. When Carpathia docked in New York, Marconi went aboard with a reporter from the New York Times to talk with Bride, the surviving operator. On June 18, 1912, Marconi gave evidence to the court of inquiry into the loss of Titanic regarding the marine telegraphy's functions and the procedures for emergencies at sea. Britain's postmaster general summed up, referring to the Titanic disaster, those who have been saved, have been saved through one man, Mr. Marconi, and his marvelous invention. Marconi was offered free passage on Titanic before she sank, but had taken Lusitania three days earlier. As his daughter Dina later explained, he had paperwork to do and preferred the public stenographer aboard that vessel. 
Continuing work. Over the years, the Marconi companies gained a reputation for being technically conservative, in particular by continuing to use inefficient spark transmitter technology which could only be used for radio telegraph operations, long after it was apparent that the future of radio communication lay with continuous wave transmissions which were more efficient and could be used for audio transmissions. Somewhat belatedly, the company did begin significant work with continuous wave equipment beginning in 1915, after the introduction of the oscillating vacuum tube, valve. The new street works factory in Chelmsford was the location for the first entertainment radio broadcasts in the United Kingdom in 1920, employing a vacuum tube transmitter and featuring Dame Nellie Melba. In 1922, regular entertainment broadcasts commenced from the Marconi Research Center at Great Baddow, forming the prelude to the BBC, and he spoke of the close association of aviation and wireless telephony in that same year at a private gathering with Florence T. Zach Parbury, and even spoke of interplanetary wireless communication. Later years In 1914, Marconi was made a senator in the Italian Senate and appointed Honorary Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order in the UK. During World War I, Italy joined the Allied side of the conflict, and Marconi was placed in charge of the Italian military's radio service. He attained the rank of lieutenant in the Italian Army and of commander in the Italian Navy. In 1929, he was made a Marquis by King Victor Emmanuel III. Marconi joined the Italian Fascist Party in 1923. In 1930, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini appointed him President of the Royal Academy of Italy, which made Marconi a member of the Fascist Grand Council. Marconi died in Rome on July 20, 1937 at age 63, following a series of heart attacks, and Italy held a state funeral for him. As a tribute, shops on the street where he lived were closed for national mourning. In addition, at 6 p.m. the next day, the time designated for the funeral, all BBC transmitters and wireless post office transmitters in the British Isles observed two minutes of silence in his honour. The British Post Office also sent a message requesting that all broadcasting ships honour Marconi with two minutes of broadcasting silence as well. His remains are housed in the Villa Griffone at Sasso Marconi, Emilia Romagna, which assumed that name in his honour in 1938. In 1943, the Supreme Court of the United States handed down a decision on Marconi's radio patents restoring some of the prior patents of Oliver Lodge, John Stone Stone, and Nikola Tesla. The decision was not about Marconi's original radio patents and the court declared that their decision had no bearing on Marconi's claim as the first to achieve radio transmission, just that since Marconi's claim to certain patents were questionable, he could not claim infringement on those same patents. There are claims the High Court was trying to nullify a World War I claim against the United States government by the Marconi Company via simply restoring the non-Marconi prior patent. Personal Life Marconi had a brother, Alfonso, and a stepbrother, Luigi. On March 16, 1905, Marconi married the Honorable Beatrice O'Brien, 1882-1976, a daughter of Edward O'Brien, 14th Baron in Chicken, having met her in Poole in 1904. They had three daughters, Dina, 1908-1998, Joya, 1916-1996, and Lucia, and a son, Giulio, second Marchese Marconi, 1910-1971. In 1913, the Marconis returned to Italy and became part of Rome society. Beatrice served as a lady-in-waiting to Queen Elena. The Marconis divorced in 1924, and, at Marconi's request, the marriage was annulled on April 27, 1927, so he could remarry. Beatrice Marconi married her second husband, Laborio Marignoli, Marchese di Monte Corona, on March 3, 1924 and had a daughter, Flaminia. On June 12, 1927, religious June 15, Marconi married Maria Cristina Butzi Scali, 1900-1994, only daughter of Francesco, Count Butzi Scali. They had one daughter, Maria Elettra Elena Anna who married Prince Carlo Giovanelli, 1942-2016, in 1966, 
they later divorced. For unexplained reasons, Marconi left his entire fortune to his second wife and their only child, and nothing to the children of his first marriage. Later in life, Marconi was an active Italian fascist and an apologist for their ideology and actions such as the attack by Italian forces in Ethiopia. Marconi wanted to personally introduce in 1931 the first radio broadcast of a pope, Pius XI, and did announce at the microphone, with the help of God, who places so many mysterious forces of nature at man's disposal, I have been able to prepare this instrument which will give to the faithful of the entire world the joy of listening to the voice of the Holy Father. <laughs>